Um, so the last topic for today before the dinner is one that uh, is extremely important. That is of the eye problems that occur, occur in Jacobson syndrome. In years past, Dr. Colin Shear has given this talk. This year we're very fortunate to have his colleague, Dr. Ariel Hallery, from the same group at Rady Children's Hospital uh, present. I think Harry and Colin together have probably seen more children with Jacobson syndrome than certainly any other ophthalmology group in the world. So we're really thrilled to have you today. Harry is speaking today because tomorrow he's on his way up to Ireland. And in fact, he's going back to children's right after his talk to operate on some children this evening. So we deeply appreciate his taking uh, some time out of his very busy day to be here this afternoon. We have a few things for him as well. I'm assuming you're a wine drinker, but I shouldn't make that assumption necessarily. So. It's a safe assumption. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not, we'll come up with an alternative. <laughs> so. Thank you very much. There you are. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to San Diego. I hear a lot of English accents in the audience, so um, it's nice to escape the rain. I am a pediatric neuro-ophthalmologist, so um, I am about as rare as Jacobson syndrome. There are maybe 50 of us in the US. So this is your opportunity to ask any questions that you want. There are no stupid questions. And, and I want you just to you feel free to interrupt, um, and, and at the end there will be time for questions. So there are a lot of um, common problems with children around the world irrespective of whether they have a so-called syndrome or not and there are lots of myths where people are not sure um, if the things that they've learned from their mother are actually true so we're going to talk about um, the true findings and also things that that we should maybe try and dispel as not being correct so we can stop lying to our children So a couple of things, it's a little test, but is it true that if you read for prolonged periods of time in dim light that it can affect your eyes? My mother always said that. And the answer is no. Wearing glasses that are too strong can affect your eyesight and damage them? The answer is no. Um, and then if children sit too close to the TV, that can damage your eyesight? No. Particularly for children who have special needs, they love to sit on top of the TV. There is no radiation from televisions. And the fact of the matter is, if you have a tiny screen, the kids want to be right on top of it. And if you get the biggest, fanciest plasma TV, the children want to be right on top of it. So don't harass your children for those things. Let them read in the dark and if they want to wear your glasses, let them wear your glasses because it can be very difficult to transition children who don't need glasses for years and then get an eye exam and we discover that they need glasses. It can be difficult to transition them if you have associated wearing glasses early on as a bad thing. So if they want to wear your glasses, let them try it. A number of years ago we were fortunate to see a lot of patients with Jacobson syndrome thanks to Paul at the Children's Hospital in San Diego and, and we realized that there are certain conditions that are a little bit more common um, in children with Jacobson than in other syndromes. So I'm just going to talk about a few of them and maybe some of you have children or no children who have these findings. Oh, excuse me. So the first one is a coloboma. So a coloboma used to be referred to as a cat eye because it's an uh, a oval shaped, um, I guess, malformation of the iris. Your eye, as you develop in utero, at around three weeks, actually folds together. Two sides fold together to make a ball, and there's a, an area called the orbital fissure. And the orbital fissure is the area that seals that ball together. Any abnormality in that area can lead to a coloboma. So you can have a coloboma of your iris, or you can have a coloboma of any portion of the inside of your eye. And the most important thing about colobomas is, number one, in all children they lead to astigmatism, which we'll talk about, and they can lead to visual loss. However, most children with colobomas, it's an insignificant issue for them. The next thing that, and as you walk around the conference, you're going to see this, telecanthus or telecanthus, which is a, a wide separation of the orbits 
with a flattened nasal bridge. It's very common, but it's of no pathological significance and it does not cause any visual problems. It leads to a little bit of confusion as to whether children have strabismus. Strabismus is whether their eyes are perfectly straight or turn inwards or turn outwards, and, and we'll address that later. Ptosis, spelled P-T-O-S-I-S. This is an extreme form of ptosis, and a ptosis is basically a droopy lid. Probably 85% of children who have Jacobson have some degree of ptosis when you compare one eye to the other. And our definition for ptosis is where your eyelid touches the colored part of your eye. Most of us, our eyelid touches that area between 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock. If you imagine your eye as a clock, if it drops one millimeter below that, then you have some degree of ptosis. Again, ptosis can lead to other eye conditions, and we'll talk about them, but again, unless it's cosmetically unacceptable, or it causes visual issues, we don't have to do anything about it. More importantly, with this syndrome, you can have a spectrum of intracranial abnormalities. So again, in, and maybe people have talked about this earlier on, but in development you can have um, changes to your brain. Where the change occurs is very important to us. So there was a condition known as de Morsier syndrome, and de Morsier was a, a European physician who described a condition in children who were of short stature and Post-mortem, they found out that these children had what's called a genesis of the corpus callosum. So your corpus callosum is an area in your brain that takes information from the right to the left side and, and, and vice versa. And it's very important for conditions with regard to higher thinking and higher uh, neurological functioning. One of those would be the ability to, to see an object in space and maybe draw it on a piece of paper or take a piece of paper with the drawing on it and, and conceptualize it as an object in free space. So it's involved in higher thinking and, and higher visual processing. Many children have variants of a genesis of the corpus callosum. So you can have some children who have a little bit of corpus callosum and some who have none as in this picture. And basically what the circular area shows, there should be a little bridge between those two circles represented by the two semicircles. In this child they are absent. De Morsier syndrome is also associated with pituitary insufficiency. So unless it specifically has pituitary changes, we call it a variant of um, corpus callosum agenesis, and that leads in children with Jacobson to this condition, which is optic nerve hypoplasia. All that means is a small optic nerve. The beauty of the way we're made, I guess, is that we have two eyes. Most people who have optic nerve hypoplasia only have hypoplasia of one eye, and the amount of hypoplasia tends to vary. We have learned over time because we have a specialized practice, we see many children who have optic nerve hyplasia. It's relatively rare, but they're referred to us. Almost never when I'm asked by a parent, okay, my child has optic nerve hypoplasia. how do you think they will see? And we can never answer that question anymore because I have had children who come in who have, this is a tiny, tiny optic nerve. We have children who come in who have tiny optic nerves who will see 20, 30, or in, for Europeans that would be the equivalent of um, 8 over 6, or 6 over 8. And we have children who have almost perfect optic nerves who see 2200, um, which is really 6 over 60 for the Europeans. So you cannot tell or how those children will do, so we assume that all these children will have great potential, and we treat them on that basis. Strabismus, super common. If you have a child who has this syndrome and they haven't had an eye exam, they need an eye exam for this very reason. Because strabismus is a misalignment of the eye. And, and basically, your eyes are either straight or they're not. And if they're not straight, you have strabismus. There are different types. You can have horizontal strabismus or vertical. And it, the pictures behind you show a number of different types. You have um, on the, if you look at the first one, the eyes are straight. 
second from the top, you can see that as we look at it, the left eye is down. So that person has hypotropia or a decrease um, in f a decrease in the eye from the horizontal plane. Third picture or the middle picture, the, the left eye as you look at it is upwards. Um, the next, the eye clearly is visibly out. And in the bottom one, the eye is in just a tiny little bit. Um, What's really important about strabismus for us in treating children who have any sort of um, developmental delay or learning delay is that multiple studies have shown that children who have strabismus are treated entirely differently. As an example of how people waste money in corporations, a big uh, um, firm, I think it was IBM, got their human resources people to do a study. And what they did was they took pictures of so-called perfectly normal people with straight eyes. And, and then they altered them with Photoshop. And they turned, for some people, they turned their eyes in. And for some people, they turned them out. And what they did was they asked the same human resource people in different divisions to rate those people upon intelligence and trustworthiness and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, all the people with straight eyes did average, I guess, okay. People whose eyes turned outwards were considered to be less intelligent. And people whose eyes inwards, who turned inwards, were considered to be not trustworthy. But all of the patients or people with strabismus were deemed way less likely to be good candidates for a job. So for us, when we see a tiny amount of strabismus, we're very aggressive in the treatment of it. And that can be controversial. Many providers will say, well, we don't think you should do that because these children have other issues and they may have other health issues. And, and we take the exact opposite approach, which is we feel we should fix anything that we can fix that gives even the slightest opportunity for them to lead a better life. Um, and, and pediatric ophthalmology is absolutely not rocket science, but it's stuck in the mud from a hundred years ago and, and it's very, very controversial. So you will find differing opinions depending upon where you go and, and you know they do say that if you put two physicians in a room you'll get three opinions so it is good to get a second opinion usually though you should cut your losses because the more opinions you get it gets confusing and, and usually the thing to do is take the opinion that you like best we would operate for a very small deviation in a patient who had Jacobson's syndrome way more quickly than in a patient who didn't have other issues. Um, and then also, there's a separate study that discusses social interaction in patients with strabismus, and it's clearly documented that so-called, I guess, average intelligence adults have a, a problem talking to people who have strabismus. So many children who have syndromes already look a little bit different anyway. And unless you're used to dealing with those children, it, it can be difficult to interact with them. In my office, we have a whole variety of patients. And, and when we have a new staff member who's joined us, who's not used to pediatrics, and we're trying to teach them and make them part of the team, they're very uncomfortable in dealing with patients with strabismus. And they'll walk out and say, I don't know which eye to look at. And I'm not sure you know, whether they're looking at me or not. And then over time, they realize that it's really more their issue than the child's issue. So again, for uh, as, a, as a lesson for these children, and small deviations are probably worth fixing from a visual point of view, from a social point of view, and also just from an integration point of view. But if you ask one of my partners, they might say something different. Nystagmus. Nystagmus is a rapid eye movement. Again, super common in this syndrome. And what it means is our, our brain is developed in such a way to control our eyes to do a number of different things. So we have different types of eye movements. We have what's called smooth pursuit eye movement where you see something walking across, you see a person walking across the street and you just follow them as they walk across the street and your eyes move slowly and that's smooth pursuit. What sometimes happens though is 
something out of the corner of your eye and you turn your eye rapidly to see it. That's called a saccadic movement. It's a rapid eye movement. Um, and then you have what's called micro saccades. So your, our eyes constantly move a teeny little bit because your retina is developed in such a way if an image stabilizes on your retina, your brain will ignore it because of the risk of retinal damage. So our, our brain moves our eyes a tiny amount called a micro saccade all the time so that different rods and cones get constantly stimulated so that your brain does not ignore the image. So eye movement is a really important but difficult thing to control. If there's any intracranial abnormality, we tend to have problems with that eye control. So you get nystagmus, and nystagmus is a rapid movement. It can be upwards or downwards or to the side, or it can be a torsional movement. What that does is it degrades visual acuity. So if you have a patient who everything else is normal, they have no colobomas, they have no optic nerve hypoplasia, they have no other of the things we're going to talk about, but they have nystagmus and their eyes are shaking like this the whole time, they cannot see very well. So patients with nystagmus frequently see 2200 at distance, but that improves to 2020 up close. So you will see people, their eyes shake the whole time and yet they love to sit in the corner and read a book and their parents will say they, they play with the iPad or they, they like to read their book or they color the whole time because they recognize for close-up stuff, the movement stops. Again, we have treatments for this, There's, and it's very controversial. There are surgical treatments for patients with nystagmus. We can treat vertical or horizontal or torsional nystagmus. So we can treat all types of nystagmus. I've been at Children's in San Diego about 12 years now, and I've done over 200 nystagmus surgeries. Every sing and, and they tend to be in patients who have multiple issues. Every single patient has either stayed the same or gotten better. I have never had a patient get worse. And many patients have had spectacular results. We've had patients who've gone literally from 2200 to 2020. The surgery takes 40 minutes, maybe less. It's a general anesthetic, but almost everything for children is a general anesthetic. But again, it's, it's worthwhile considering, and that's the beauty of a conference like this. It gives you the opportunity to see what things may be available here or in other countries. And, and sometimes, you have to shop around. I mean, if you don't like what you hear in one place, you have to go somewhere else and, and ask again because you are the best advocates for your patients or for your children. Basic anatomy. Physicians in general don't know anything about eyeballs. We get the most strange referrals all the time, but it's, it's, it's a really complex thing. Any portion of your eye can have a problem in this syndrome because it can be malformed very, very early on. Anything that has a fissure in it can have a coloboma. So your retina, your, your lens, your uvea, or your optic nerve. So all of these children absolutely need an eye exam by a pediatric ophthalmologist. And I'm not looking for business, but if you've ever gone to your adult ophthalmologist, you go in, you sit down, there's no crying, screaming children, usually. They, they do a quick eye exam at the slit lamp. They use things that children won't use. So you have to have a pediatric ophthalmology exam. Your children have to be dilated and, and you kind of have to be willing to sit there for an hour or a couple of hours because things inside the eye have to be identified and it's difficult in a child who's not cooperative. So go to the people who, who know what they're doing. Don't leave these children to the care of adult ophthalmologists. That's not a plug against my adult ophthalmology buddies. All children, almost all children, have a refractive error. And I mean all children in the entire world. We're, most are born with a refractive error and some develop it. They're really important though because if you have somebody who's 2040 and you can take them to 2020 with a pair of glasses or 2200 and you can take them to 2100 with a pair of glasses, that's huge. And glasses are the simplest thing to do. If you look around, most of these children have glasses. And it's really simple. People get confused all the time. But refractive errors are very simple. 
simple. And it's all based upon the thing we hate, at least I hated, which was physics and the way light rays are refracted as they pass through your eye. Every surface that a light ray hits is a refracting surface. So it hits your cornea, it hits your tear film, it refracts and moves a little bit. It hits your cornea, it moves, it hits your aqueous, which is in the front of your eye and your lens and so forth. But for these children, the biggest issue is the length of their eyeball and whether they get a refractive error or not. So, simple things. You get eye strain, you get difficulty with concentration, you get difficulty with schoolwork, you get difficulty with um, peer interaction because they'll say, well, he doesn't look at me as I walk across the room because many of these children have undiagnosed refractive errors. It's really easy to treat them. Myopia is the most common refractive error in the entire world and part, part of the reason for that is that it's increasing in frequency. 86% of Hong Kong Chinese people are nearsighted now um, in a recent study and, and part of that is probably because in the olden days you needed to see far away to see marauding animals and cavemen coming at you. But nowadays we need to see stuff up close. Everything we do is usually within the 10 feet in front of us and with computers it's into 2 or 3 feet in front of us. So each subsequent generation is becoming more nearsighted. If you have nearsighted parents, they're really likely to have nearsighted children and those children tend to have a greater refractive error than their parents. But what is it? It's simply the fact that the eyeball is a little bit too long. Your, your eyeball looks big, but it's only when you're born about 18 millimeters long, and then at most in the average person, it's 24 millimeters long fully grown. But some children, their eyeball continues to grow as they get older, and they get myopia, simply corrected with a pair of glasses. Farsightedness, all children, all normal children, are born farsighted. So that means that their eyeball is too small and as they grow taller their eyeball gets bigger and bigger and bigger and they get less farsighted. A combination of nearsightedness and farsightedness so in one portion of your eye is the most important thing that we need to talk about. So it's called astigmatism. The, the writing on the bottom is blurred a little bit. So for those of you who have normal eyesight or who have glasses and, and their eyesight's corrected with their glasses, that little bit of blurred vision on the bottom, that blurred writing, is what people with astigmatism see. They don't see clearly up close. So they're not nearsighted. They don't see clearly at distance. They, they don't really see clearly anywhere. They have what's called a cone of vision. And they see okay in that cone. But what that means is their occipital cortex, which is the portion of their brain that takes vision, never fully develops to recognize crisp vision. So things always look a little bit blurred. Trees never have nice clear outlines with leaves. They always just look a little bit fuzzy. Writing looks like this. Astigmatism is super common and most adult ophthalmologists will not treat astigmatism less than a diopter and a half. A diopter and a half is just a measurement, so less than a diopter and a half. For us, we will treat any degree of astigmatism greater than half of a diopter, particularly in children who have other issues. So, um, and, and refractive errors are very common in this syndrome, so each of these children should probably have an eye exam by a pediatric ophthalmologist at least once a year because they're children and they're growing. And as they grow, their refractive error changes. So children who have glasses, as they grow, usually get new glasses once a year or so. So who gets glasses? We give anybody who's greater than one myopia a pair of glasses. Anybody, as I say, who has less, who has more than half a diopter of astigmatism glasses. And the reason that we have to be really careful with glasses is there's a condition called amblyopia. Amblyopia is where you have a normal eye structurally, but it doesn't see well. Amblyopia is caused in many cases by not correcting a refractive error. And what happens is your brain decides okay, I see better with my right eye than I do with my left because my left eye has half a diopter of astigmatism that's not corrected. So when I look at stuff, with my right eye it's perfectly clear. With my left eye it's a little bit fuzzy. We're all human, which means we're all lazy. So our brain says, 
going to ignore the left eye, I'm going to use the right eye. Over time, your occipital cortex structurally changes. Your occipital cortex is back here at the back of your head. It's what you put, your, what you put on the pillow at night. But it structurally changes from serving 50% of the occipital cortex for the right eye to 50% for the left eye can actually change to 98% to 2%. And that amblyopia, the more profound it is, the more difficult it is to reverse. Unfortunately, the, w the best thing to do is to avoid it because if you develop it, almost the only way to correct it is with patching. And for any of you who have patched children, it, it's excruciating. It's the worst thing ever because they hate it, you hate it, and it goes on, in many cases, for 17 years. You can correct amblyopia with patching for up to 17 years. Um, I, when I knew I was going to give this talk, I emailed some friends of mine to see who had seen a patient who had something different that they had recognized. So we're just going to talk about a couple of common things that you're probably going to see in the first seven or eight years of life of your children. People talk about styes all the time. So a sty is an infection of your eyelash follicle. So when you look at the eyelashes, you see a little infection right at the base of the eyelash. And if you pluck that eyelash, that will release the infection and that's all you need to do. They're super common in Jacobson syndrome. This is not a sty because it's not in the eyelash. It's up in the eyelid and it's called a chalazion. So it's basically a pimple in your eyelid that sits there and gets bigger and bigger and bigger over time and they have to be drained. Treat them early with hot compresses and they go away. One of my friends in Australia has a patient who develops one of these about every six weeks or so. So this condition is called blepharitis. Very common in Jacobson. If you look, the eyelashes are crusted together and you can see little flakes of dandruff-like stuff. That's Staph aureus. Children who frequently go to hospital get multi-resistant Staph aureus, so, or MRSA. And people talk about you know, the increasing incidence of MRSA in the country and it's very common in children who have a lot of hospital visits. These children get a lot of blepharitis, which is a Staph aureus infection on their eyelids, but frequently it's multi-resistant Staph aureus on their eyelashes that leads to this excoriation and crusting of their lids. The simplest thing to do is to keep it clean because it's almost impossible to remove Staph aureus. We recommend that all children wear sunglasses, and the reason that they should wear sunglasses is that almost all children, especially in California, develop sun-related eye changes, and it's 100% of children irrespective of their genetic makeup. So if you have a child who doesn't need glasses for refractive error, they should wear glasses for ultraviolet care, because this is a pinguecula. If anybody surfs, you see or knows people who surf, they get that little yellowish discoloration on their eyeballs and it's permanent. And if you don't treat it, pinguecules lead to this, which is where the conjunctival tissue grows right onto the cornea. All avoidable by sunglasses. Children will wear glasses from the age of two. They'll wear sunglasses. And if you're trying to get your child or give advice as to how to wear sunglasses, the best time to put them on is have the child walk outside the door. And, and on a sunny day when they're dazzled and startled and they close their eye, put the sunglasses on at that time. Don't put them on in the house 10 minutes before you go out because they'll be broken before you leave the front door. I put this up to talk about red eyes. So everybody gets red eyes. We get in my office probably 30 phone calls a day about red eyes. So the general thing is we all get them. A red eye that's painful is an issue. A red eye that lasts more than two days is an issue. But if you or your child gets red eyes that last for a couple of hours, that's nothing to worry about. If they've been swimming and they get red eyes for a couple of hours, that's nothing to worry about. If they've been in the sun without their sunglasses for a couple of hours and their eyes are red, that's nothing to worry about. So red eyes are only for children, are, are an issue for children where it lasts for a day or two and, and or painful. This is a herpetic ulcer. It's called a dendrite. And the reason it's called a dendra or a dendritic ulcer, Dendrite is the old word for, for root, as in root of a tree. And if you look up there, it's an ulcer that's linear, that has branches that look like roots. So, 100% of people over the age of 30 have 
a type of herpes in their body that remains dormant. If you are sick or if you have a tendency to be sick, then that reactivates herpes. This is essentially a cold sore on your lip, er, sorry, a cold sore on your eyeball. So most adults have had in, at some point in their life a cold sore on their lip. This is a cold sore on your eye. These are painless for most children. They're very common in children who are sick, but if they go untreated for more than a couple of days, they lead to permanent visual loss. So you have to, we're seeing more and more of these in children in general, especially in California because of sun exposure, but we see them all the time in children who are in hospitals a lot. And we have many children who get admitted to hospital for something totally unrelated. And then they're in for a couple of days, and because of the stress of being in there, and hospitals are never comfortable, no matter what they do to make them comfortable, they can develop these. So if your child develops a red eye while in hospital, irrespective of what else is going on for them, you have to make sure that you get an ophthalmology consult. Really easy to treat, but um, uh, difficult long term if they get scar tissue on the cornea because they will lose eyesight. This is a hyphema, and the reason I put it up here is uh, there's an increasing incidence of spontaneous hyphema in the world in general, and it tends to be associated, we think, with myopia. So as children get more myopic, they get stretching of their blood vessels, their eyes are a little bit more um, frail, and a small little finger poke or bang it with a toy or trip over and hit their head can lead to this. If you see it, you can't ignore it because this can lead rapidly to blindness. And we have seen, one of my colleagues in my office has seen um, a Jacobson patient with a high femur, so probably who is a high myope. So if you have children who wear glasses who are very nearsighted or you know people who have it, it's something to be aware of. You can do a screening test yourself. So, you know, no one wants to go to the ophthalmologist all the time. And we all, I have three children, and I'm always looking at them thinking, oh my gosh, are their eyes straight or not? And, and every photograph I look. So if, if you're wondering if your child has crossed eyes, when you take a photograph, See the little white dot in the center of each eye. You look at the, that's called, that's called the, the, just the, the light reflex. You look at the position of the light reflex on both eyes. If it's in the same position in both eyes, then your child does not have strabismus. Many children who have facial abnormalities, whether it be telecanthus or a little bit of extra skin folds called epicanthic skin folds, if they turn their head even slightly for the photograph, it looks like their eyes are crossed. So, Take a photograph yourself, look at it, look at the position of, the white, of the, the white reflex, and if it's in the same position on both eyes, you do not need to panic. This is what can happen though. If you look at the eye, as we look at it on the left hand side, it's a nice red reflex. So when you, when you take the photograph, and you look at the photograph, the red reflex is nice and bright and crisp. The one on the left is grey and dull. An asymmetric red reflex in a, in a photograph should get you referral. This child, what they have on the, on the picture on your right is a cataract. I do have to go to surgery in a little bit, so um, that's the end of my talk. Does anybody have any questions? This is your time to get your questions answered. Yes? My, my daughter is having issues where um, I guess the eyes aren't closing right. She's had um, chronic dry eye that's making um, a red patch. Uh -huh. um, aside from just putting the glasses in the appointment, and, and then I'm sure she has bad eyesight. You, and, and they, they put prism in her glasses? Is that what you said? No, they just want her to put eye drops and then um, like the more patrol in the at night. Uh-huh. So when she sleeps, because that's, okay. I guess, she's looking at so, so that's a good question. There's a condition called lag ophthalmus. And lag ophthalmus is common in 20% of normal people. And what happens is when you sleep, your eyelids elevate a little bit and you can see the white part of the eye. So it's normal in 20% of people. It's only an issue if when they wake up their eyes are red and they stay red for more than a couple of minutes in the morning. The simplest thing to do is to treat them with a little bit of lacrolube or some sort of artificial um, ointment. Most insurance plans don't pay for those ointments. So what you can do is ask your physician to prescribe erythromycin, which is super common, 
and many drugs are resistant to or many bacteria are resistant to erythromycin. So we, it's not a front first line antibiotic. But if your physician prescribes that for you, then it's covered by your insurance. And what you do is you put you put a little bit in, you pull down the eyelid, and you push the lower eyelid up to meet the upper eyelid. Because the issue in lag ophthalmos is a little line right above the bottom eyelid that gets red. So you push the, the lower eyelid up to move all that ointment around and lubricate the eye. But to keep it cheap, ask for erythromycin ointment. Because that, and, and in general, for any of these lubricating ointments or drops, they range in price from $10 to $200. And the drug companies will tell you that they're entirely different. For certain conditions they are, but for most conditions they're not. So, and especially for children, get the cheapest drops that you can get because the other ones are a waste of money. Anybody else? My daughter alternates her eyes, so she only uses one eye at a time. Uh -huh. And, and uh, her eye guy says that um, that's good uh -huh. if she's alternating. That's because you're in the NHS, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we have the same thing in Ireland. We have it's, so it's essentially a public, um, it's a public uh, insurance, and they're not motivated to do anything for you. So, a lot of times, what has happened in those in those instances, they say a child who has exotropia, which I'm sure your daughter, uh -huh. so her eyes turn outwards. So they'll use one eye or the other eye, depending upon which eye is turned out. So, you know, if the right eye is turned out, they're looking with the left eye. If the left eye is turned out, they're looking with the right eye. But in, in those positions, they have no binocular vision. So what binocular vision, in, it, how it works is you have two eyes. And when they look at the same thing, because your eyes are separated in space a tiny little bit, your brain sees two slightly different images. And it makes those two images into one image, but it, it gives that image depth. So, so that's how when, you know, if you go to pour a cup of coffee and some people who have no depth perception will hold a cup and they'll hold a pot and they'll put the pot on, on or in your case, teapots. They'll put the teapot on the cup and pour the tea. But, but if they have good binocular vision, they can put the cup on the table and pour from up high. Park in a car, um, you know, trying to judge distances for, for sports, particularly sports where there's hand eye coordination, like tennis. Um, it's very difficult to see. We would do it differently from the NHS system because, again, for these children, if they have an exotropia, an outward turn, we would fix that to give them some binocular vision. And the reason that binocular vision is so important is, is for those other reasons, but also when they turn out like that, you have all the social consequences and you have the issues of adults who look at them and don't or feel uncomfortable talking to them because their eyes are, are drifting. So even a small drift for us is usually an indication for surgery. And that's a totally different approach than they take in the NHS system. And like a squ like squint squ yeah, yeah. Do you, I mean the old word for or the, or the common word for strabismus is squint. But you know, for us, for squint surgery, for your daughter, all you have to do is you take off. It sounds awful, but you just you take off the outside muscle on each side, you move it back, and you put it back on. It's literally it's a 12-minute procedure. So they're under anesthesia certainly at our hospital for about 20 minutes. I think what he said was it's, it's hard, to, it would be guessing because you can't sit with her and do the measurements. Uh -huh. it just, but I mean, so you'd have to guess and, and, he, and he didn't want to waste his time or her time uh -huh. on doing it if it was just a guess. I mean that's why they, they call it you know, it's the practice of medicine. You ha there's, there's a lot of guesswork in medicine. And when, if people tell you that they know, I hope I'm not contradicting um, Paul, but if they tell you that they know exactly what they're going to do and exactly what the outcome will be, th that's just not how it is. And, and the aim, your brain is able to control your eyes a certain amount and fuse a certain amount, even for your daughter. So she's able to control it a certain amount. 
but, but when her deviation is out like this and her eyes are wide apart, it's just too much and she can't get them in. So our aim is to get the children into a range where their brain can take over and control their eyes for, for more of the day and that when they drift, they don't drift as far. It's almost impossible not to get an improvement in squint surgery unless you just do the wrong surgery, which is nowadays almost impossible to do. So, um, he, I mean, it's probably worth your while to ask for a second opinion and, and ask for surgical intervention. Because if you can give your daughter even a little bit of depth perception, she'll do way better. I don't know, I don't know if she does this, but a lot of times when you have no depth perception, people will see a crack on the, on the pavement, on the sidewalk, and they'll stop at it and they'll put their foot on it because they're not sure if it's a crack or a step. So, whereas if you have binocular vision, you know it's a crack and you just keep walking. Going down the stairs, they tend to be very hesitant. Um, things like that, just general manual dexterity. Th simple things that we take for granted. We see huge improvements in children after they have their squints fixed. And we say to parents, we, we don't want to know about the vision. What's your kid doing differently? What are they doing now that they didn't do before? And they'll say, oh, they, they'll actually watch TV. They'll sit more still. They'll actually pay attention to things. They do better in school. It's, it's a life, it's a life changing surgery for only 15 minutes. You know, so other things when, when there's big risk and there's anesthetic risk and, and there's hospitalization, you know, you have to think twice about it, but it's, you know, for us it's a quick procedure, it's a day procedure, and most children are, are out of the hospital within three hours. Yeah. Um, so she does that a lot as well? She closes, she closes one eye, I bet you when she walks outside and it's a bright day. Yeah. Well, on, on what they'll do is they'll do it on bright days, and, and that's a really good sign for surgical indication, because what, what, what she's doing is, some of the time her eyes are straight, then they start to drift, so she sees double, because your eyes are not looking at the exact same thing. And then she goes, oh, I can't, that, that's awful. And then they close one eye so that they see single. But the fact that she closes one eye means she has the ability to see double, which means she has the ability to get depth perception. So again, for us, that would be another indicator to actually be even more aggressive. And you know, I mean, I worked in, in Ireland for five years. If you push your physician, a lot of times they'll actually agree to do something. But they're, you know, they're not they're not super aggressive about this. But if you come back and say, I went to a conference, I'd like you to I'd like you to at least reconsider and tell me, give me the advantages and disadvantages. But for your daughter, it could be life changing. Closes her eyes, and I'll have to say, "Open your eyes and talk to me." So, uh, and then she'll like really like bug them out. So, you know, she's an adult. Right. Though, but Is that when she's been looking at looking at things or talking to you intently? To me. I mean, I think that's a behavioural issue. You know, the only thing about is what it could be. What it could be is that that if you have again an, a little bit of an eye control issue, when you are talking to somebody and focused on them, you're looking at them close. Our eyes converge to look at things up close, and that's a normal phenomenon. Many children have what's called convergence insufficiency. So their eyes, when they're looking at things, initially they can focus on you, and then when they realize it's getting a bit, you know, it's an intense conversation with mom, their eyes will drift, they'll do the splits, they'll get a little bit of double vision and they'll close their eyes because that allows them to refocus. There are exercises, it's just what they call them pen, pencil push-ups, where you, yep, yep, and that actually will help that control a lot more. Okay. So, I believe... Yeah, just you were talking about um, closing one eye, Sydney has a tendency whenever she goes out, whenever she goes outside, she immediately uh -huh. Perhaps there was something like it was painful or something going on with that, but I think what I heard is that maybe she's just getting too much of no, well, no, I mean, what it is is, whatever, if she closes the same eye all the time, then that eye is slightly weaker than the other. So, there, there may be other issues. There might be a refractive error. There might be a little bit of amblyopia or lazy eye. And then there may be this tendency to drift outwards. So, what they do, it's the same thing. They, they walk outside. The, the light 
from both, it's, it's, a lot of times it's so intense that it, it startles them. They see a little bit of double, and then that's very distracting. And then they'll close one eye to make it single. And then, you know, because they're leaving the house and there's, they're walking down the steps and they're, it's a whole new environment for a couple of seconds. So they need to concentrate a little bit. And then when they relax, they're walking down the sidewalk, then they can open that eye and, and use their brain to try and bring that eye back in again. So it sounds as if um, it's something that could actually be worked on relatively easily. Most of these things can actually be worked upon relatively easily. She's, she's had one surgery already, and it just generally when she gets tired, her left hand drifts. drifts. Drifts upwards. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, again, it's just, so it's the same thing. It drifts, so she sees double, and she'll close that eye. It's, it, it's fixable. You know, and, and again, yeah. I mean, so what she has is called dissociated vertical deviation, where it's part of the whole thing. The, the control's not great, and the brain is just one eye will just drift off. You know, and then you, when if you click your fingers or whatever, she can pull it back in, and it straightens up. So you patch the good eye to try and make the, the bad eye stronger, but usually they do need surgery. And at some point, you have to cut your losses because it's not fair to patch your child f for eternity. And it's not, nor, nor is it fair to the parents because you know, it can be nerve-wracking sometimes. So a lot of times, again, you just have to say to your you know, ophthalmologist, we'd like a surgical opinion to fix this because it's not difficult to fix. You know, there's a great reluctance for whatever reason from pediatric ophthalmologists to do surgery. Um, and, and, you know, in general, I, I don't know if anybody else has touched upon this, but, you know, there are risks, of course, to anesthesia, but the risks to anesthesia are so overblown now compared to how they were. But, you know, we talk to our parents and they've all got a great cousin who died under anesthetic and, or, or something, you know, I mean, and he, probably he was drunk and got hit by a car, but they think it was anesthetic. In most, it is exceptionally rare to hear of serious complications from anesthesia. And, and when there are serious complications, it tends to be in very sick children who have prolonged surgery and a, you know, like a six or seven hour surgery for whatever. So what, what I'm talking about is it's literally, I mean, we have done these in as short as 10 minutes. And, and you know, but the, the longest it should be to do one muscle and one eye, if it's any more than 20 minutes, you, you should probably get a different ophthalmologist. <laughs> what about timing on the surgeries? Phase seven and a half now. She had uh, ex alternating exotropia, and we, we went back and forth with when, when to do the surgery. She, she had one, uh, but it went back and forth with the binocular <clears throat> vision and the development of that. Um, what, what's the time frame? So, so the unfortunate news for parents who patch is that there was a study, a huge study done um, recently, really well designed and a great population study and it showed that visual development actually goes on until 17. So I, when I tell that to parents who are patching, they have a four-year-old who won't patch anymore. I'm like, well, you got 13 more years of potential patching. So, so you can, for strabismus in general, so when there's, the eyes are not aligned, you can operate at any age. I recently operated on an 87-year-old who just said that she was just sick of it, you know, and she didn't want to meet her maker with her eyes turned out, and I said, fair enough, so we, but you can do it at any age. Earlier is better. Okay. And, and about the hypertonia with these children, because a lot of that has to do with the musculature with the eyes too, so... In, the overcorrectiveness, I guess, and all that. Right. In, in general, when there's hypotonia, when there's, you know, systemic hypotonia, it, uh, hyper or hypotonia, it does not affect the eyes. Okay. Most of the reason that they drift outwards is it's a, it's a brain control. The brain just can't control it because if you think about it, you've got six muscles on each eye. So those six have to work together, but then both eyes have to work together, and then you have smooth pursuit, you have saccadic movement and micro So you've got stuff going on the whole time. And then you've different types of retinal receptors and it's vision is super complex. The biggest physiology textbook for a single organ is Adler's Physiology of the Eye. And I've read it and it's incredibly boring and it's really thick and it's very complex. So 
That's one of those questions that everybody you ask will give you the answer within their own comfort range. So our, our answer is earlier intervention is better. If, you're gonna, if you are going to intervene, then earlier is better than later because the, the potential to build upon the foundation is greater. Many parents are non-interventional. They don't want to do anything and, and that's fair enough. But you know, I say to parents, if you think you're going to do this at some time, then let's do it now because we, we can get in there and we can do stuff and it's an easy surgery. I'm not, I'm not advocating cardiac surgery. I'm advocating a quick procedure and then because it's quick you can be conservative. We say to people, you know, it's highly likely you'll need a second surgery but the first surgery is the big one to get most of the alignment and then you come back and you tweak it a little bit but you can patch till 17 and, and we have children who have developed binocular vision after the age of 12. So, you know, I'm not so sure about that we'd go the whole way to 17, but we've had results after 12, so. Um, and um, with the cognitive, have, have there been any studies with, uh, with, the, um, with the vision and like nystagmus and stuff like that? Because um, like with her, we're, we're, doing, um, we're doing some, some herbal supplements that are basically stimulants that are supposed to help focus, similar to like ADD, ADHD type medicine. Right. And since a lot of these kids have some type of eye problem and stuff like that, it, how how tied in are the is the cognitive behavioral type stuff and the vision stuff? Have there been any studies or anything like that? You know, again, so there had, there's a ton of studies. I mean, it, and and I don't know that there's a ton of double-blind studies on herbal supplements, right. but um, there's there's a ton of studies on this sort of stuff. You need to be paying attention in order for your eyes to remain straight. Now, most of us who have normal eyesight can can you know you can you can I mean an example is you could do a lot of drugs or you could drink a lot of alcohol before you start to get an eye problem. So, you know, m most of us, are, our control is so good that, that it's not an issue. And that's why the cops use nystagmus as like a DOI checkpoint and alcohol consumption and stuff. But if you flip that on its head, a lot of these children already have a tendency to drift. So they're already struggling to hold it together. So then if they just daydream or, you, and, and that's when you'll see a lot of the strabismus, I'm sure you see this, that when she loses focus and she's not really looking at anything, that's when you notice her eyes drift because she's lost that stimulation. But it's easy to overstimulate. And, and, and we certainly don't consider you know, ADHD medicine as, an, as a therapeutic option for regular strabismus. But I have a lot of children who have a diagnosis or a presumptive diagnosis of ADHD who have a tendency to actually drift outwards. That's the, for those children, that's the most common outward drift. So um, they're probably linked for sure. Any surgical option or? Um, so, not really is the answer. I mean, you can give in, 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 if there's a very slight ptosis and it, and I mean a tiny amount that's cosmetically bothersome for somebody who wants to go to dinner for two hours, you can give them some topical epinephrine drops. So, or noradrenaline eye drops that will lift the eyelid a teeny little bit. But really the only option for, uh, the only long term option for ptosis is surgical correction. And then there are different types of surgery. We, we can shorten, and in some children we shorten the muscle in their eyelid and physically lift their eyelid. And in other children we actually put a silicone sling through their eyelid and up into their forehead and tie it in their forehead so that if they want to lift their eyelid, they have to wrinkle their forehead and that will lift their eyelid. But, you know, permanent long-term treatment for ptosis is surgical intervention. Well, we would do surgery for, for a variety of reasons, but it depends upon, you know, how bad is the ptosis? Because a lot of times, you know, you have to think, well, it's, it's a small ptosis. It's, it's noticeable, but it's small. But it's probably not worth fixing because there are no visual issues. If the eye is getting lazy because the lid droops, that's a reason to fix it. If the eye has significant astigmatism be because the eyelid droops, that's a reason to fix it. Even though your eyelid weighs very little, a 
tiny bit of extra pressure on your eyeball can cause some astigmatism. And astigmatism in one eye compared to the other will lead to a lazy eye. So there are visual reasons to lift an eyelid and then there are cosmetic reasons to lift an eyelid. Yeah, but usually surgery is the long term answer. Yes. Right. I mean, you can you can re-sling repeatedly. Yeah. I mean, you know, trying to think the, the most number of times I've done it. it but I, you know, I've, I have one patient. I've probably done it six times. So as they grow, you know, it, it changes. And and some children have a tendency to rub their eye. So the slings that we mostly use are silicone. And and they're, you know, if you if you pull on them too much, then they stretch. And if you have a sling that's in there, and you keep rubbing your eyelid, and you stretch it, it just becomes non-effective. So it becomes stretched out if you, if you rub it. Right, right. So you, but a lot of times you don't even have to replace them. You can actually go back into the forehead where it's tied, and and just tighten it up a little bit, and then. Fishing line, correct? Pardon me. It, it looks like fishing line. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's 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 you know it's like thick fishing line if you're trying to catch a shark, not thin stuff. But and and but and then you have a little knot on it with a that has a slip knot. So if it stretches, you can come back in and you know to put it in. We make five incisions, but to adjust it, yeah, you make them right above the eyelashes, up in the eyebrow, and then up in the forehead. So, but to, to adjust it, you can do it with just one incision up in the forehead. Maybe your doctors do it slightly differently, but. Yeah. Yeah, we we make we make five. Yeah, and the last one's up here, and you can adjust it up there. Yeah, so so most times what we try and do when they when they drift a little bit is not take the whole sling out, readjust it. But frankly, it's a, a sling is like a an IV um, port. You know, you can put an IV port in repeatedly. You know, you have to wait for the vein to recover and then put the port in again. But you can do the same with the sling. Yeah, we we try where possible to only do loosening surgery, so not tightening where possible. So if you if you imagine if you have a patient whose eyes drift outwards, so your choices are to loosen the two outside muscles so that the eyes will come back inwards, or to tighten the two inside muscles to pull those eyes inwards. But when you tighten a muscle, you remove tissue. You have to remove tissue. Whereas when you loosen, you never remove tissue. So I can do any combination of loosening procedures a whole bunch of times. But if they do, if if we do tightening procedures, after a while we run out of muscle. So that limits the number of times that you can do it. Just one more question. Sure. You quit rubbing one eye to the eye that has. Does it what? Um, you know, a lot of times, if you can rub your eye for a whole bunch of reasons, you know, if it's sore or if you have allergies or. But in children who see very poorly, they will rub their eye because that actually stimulates retinal receptors to flash. So you know, when you rub your eye and you see little flashes afterwards, that means that's not a good thing to do. But some children who have severe delay will rub their eyes, one or other, or sometimes both, really, really hard because it, it stimulates those little flashes and they like the flashes. Long term though, that can lead to multiple problems. So, and, and eye rubbing is way more common in children who have Down syndrome because what happens is they, they have allergies and they rub their eyes constantly and then that leads to corneal damage and astigmatism and, and retinal detachment long term. So, you know, we don't mind a little bit of eye rubbing but we strongly discourage extensive rubbing and if you have a child or know a child who does it, a, a simple way to stop them from doing it is just to make them wear their glasses because, 
you, know, you can rub your eye if you're daydreaming and not thinking about it, but if you have to take your glasses off to rub it, it's a little bit more involved and, and, and they're less likely to do it. So even if someone doesn't have any other visual problems, they, they don't, you know, the optometrist has recommended wearing glasses? Yeah, we, we'll, I mean, if they rub them enough, you can... If, for children, and f for some children, it's 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 a, just a, hab a habitual um, a behavior, and that can lead to serious consequences. So we recommend glasses for them to prevent them just getting out their eye. I think we need to let Dr. Alvaro get back to the operating room. Thank you. Thank you very much.